Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Are you expecting greater things? Well, let me tell you something. The word that the Lord gave me this morning is that God has need of you to do greater things. Amen. Amen. Now, years ago, I preached this message in Melbourne, Australia. And this man, his church was just about 50, 60 people. Today, there are over 5,000 people. If you will listen to what the word of God has to say. Many people are satisfied with just speaking in tongues. But that's one of the least of the gifts. Paul says that you, in, uh, in Corinthians that you must desire the best gifts from God. Praise God. And this morning, the Lord wants to release the gifts of the Spirit upon you. Amen. Because He has need of you to go into this world as a flame and change this world. And we have the power. Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were prepared to go into that fiery furnace and it had no effect on them. You know why? Because inside of them, they had a fire that's hotter than the flames outside. And if we look at this world now, Satan is making this fire hotter and hotter. But we have the power to undo the works of the evil one. So the title of my message this morning is, Let the Rivers Flow. Rivers of living water. The Lord never said one river is going to flow through you. He said rivers of living water. So you can operate in any one of the gifts. If you are a prophet and somebody is dying in hospital of cancer, you don't need to run for the man with the gift of healings. The Spirit of God will come upon you as he wills. But we've just got to be obedient to lay hands on people. We are not healers. He's the healer. But the Holy Spirit is right inside of you. So when you lay hands on people, you know what they see? They see nail, demon see nail pierced hands. Because we crucified with Christ. That's why they go berserk when they see us. Because we washed in the blood of Jesus. So if you have your Bibles, turn with me to Psalm 46 verse 4. While you're turning there, you know this American evangelist came to South Africa and he was sitting right next to one of the elders in the front pew. And so a cab dropped him there to come and minister. And then he realized after the cab that dropped him that he left his dentures in the hotel room. And he said to this elder sitting next to him, he said, excuse me, sir, but do you wear dentures? So this man said, nobody's asked me a question like that, but yes, I do. He said, man, I left my dentures in the hotel room and I, I look out, I can't pronounce my words properly. Look out, look without my dentures. I've never preached without dentures. Please give me your dentures. This man said, I don't even give these dentures to my wife. But Americans don't give up. He begged the man for about half an hour, then he got an idea. He said, sir, for the sake of the gospel, give me your dentures. Guy took it out, gave it to him. He tried it. He said, no, these don't fit. The man said, praise the Lord. He put his dentures back. So the guy jumped from that side of the church right to the other side. He said, I think that guy's wearing dentures. When he saw this man, he slid right next to this man and he said, sir, I've got a very embarrassing situation here. I was supposed to preach it this morning, but I left my dentures in the hotel room. The man said, you came to the right man. He put his hand in this pocket. He pulled out a, a set in a plastic bag. He said, try these. He put that in. He said, no, these don't fit. He said, okay, give it back. He put it back in his pocket. He put his hand in this side. He pulled out another set. He said, try these. Guy put those in. He said, no, these don't fit either. He said, give it back here. Put his hand in this pocket. He pulled out another plastic bag. He said, try these. The guy said, no, these don't fit either. Then he put his hand in this pocket. Pulled out another set. He said, try these. The guy put that in. He said, wow, these fit better than my originals. The man said, you can have them. But then he wasted so much time looking for the, the dentures. He grabbed the cordless mic 
because they called him up to preach and jumped into the pool pit and he started preaching. He said, God is never too late. He's always on time. He said, I have such a difficult situation here this morning that I tell, cannot tell the congregation what it is. But right in this church, God provided me with a dentist. The man jumped up. He said, I'm not a dentist. I'm the undertaker. <laughs> and he preached a dead sermon that morning. Oh, wow. Hallelujah. Psalm 46 verse 4. Let's get serious now. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The most holy place where the most high dwells. God will help her in the break of day. Nations are in uproar. Kingdoms fall. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. Let's bow our heads in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word. We know that the grass withereth and the flower fadeth, but the word of the Lord will stand forever. You said, so shall my word be that goes forth out of my mouth. It shall not return to me void of power, but shall accomplish that which I please and where to I send it. You sent your word and you healed them. How much more will you not heal people here in this congregation? Lord, you are a healer, but you're not only a healer, you are a provider. You're king of kings and you're lord of lords. You're the all-sufficient one. You're a miracle-working God. And what's impossible with man is possible with you. You're the God of the impossible. And so many times we face impossible situations, but you make the impossible possible. Lord, perform miracles this morning. You are a miracle worker. And so we give you glory, honor, and praise. Holy Spirit, you are the master evangelist. Take complete charge of this meeting. Release the gifts of the Spirit that people may go and get this job done. We are moving towards the last days. Last night when we went to bed and this morning when we got up, we're so much closer to the second coming, but the church of God is complacent. The giant is asleep. Let us rise up and take our cities for God. As we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. Now, before you sit down, I want you to shout because faith comes by hearing and hearing the word of God. Let the rivers flow. Let the rivers flow. That's only 5.6%. Let's get that percentage up. One, two, three. Let the rivers flow. Let's do it again. Let the now, every time I point to you, I want you to shout that. Amen. 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 Praise God. You may be seated. Psalm 46 verse 4. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. The most holy place where the most high dwells. God is within her. She shall not fall. Amen. God will help her in the break of day. Nations are in uproar. If you see what's happening all around us, nations are in uproar. Kingdoms are falling. Amen. He lifts his voice and the earth melts. You know what the Lord said to me? He said, it's a great catastrophe when somebody says, once upon a time, God used to use me mightily. He said, look, this river was flowing in great maj majesty. And people came and quenched their thirst. Some people even lived off the river. Animals came and quenched their thirst there. Some people bathed themselves in the river. And even they fished and ate from the river. But now that riverbed is empty, dry, and useless. Nothing's happening there. I said, Lord, what is that? He said, as when some, a man or woman of God says, once upon a time, God used to use me mightily. He said, tell my people that the anointing is supposed to be forever increasing. Amen. I've seen people get out of wheelchairs, blind eyes open, deaf ears becoming unstopped. But I even seen God raise the dead. And God wants to use you in the same measure. You know, I was preaching in Lesotho, Africa, and we had a, a week of revival there. 
And I spoke on faith. I said, you too can walk on the water. And we were wiped out because we had a week of meetings and we were sitting in this pastor's room, uh, in his living room, and we, you know, we had just finished the revival and we were relaxing. When a lady came running in and said, Pastor Newbury, you must come and raise my mother from the dead. I said, lady, you don't understand. If your mother's dead, she's dead. She brought a mother. She rode for 50 miles with a mother dead on the back of a pickup. I looked at this man of God. He looked at me. I said, said, she said, you preached yesterday on faith, but you got no faith. Thank God it's not the faith of the preacher. Faith moves the hand of God. She said, you speak about faith, but you got no faith. You know, that woman really challenged me. So I said to him, okay, let's just go. We never expected anything to happen because one of our team members died. We prayed the whole night. He never got up from the dead. We walked outside, and I don't like seeing dead people. We put our hands on her, and we said, in the name of Jesus, rise up. The woman sat up. I ran 100 yards in about five seconds. (laughs) I found out that nothing is impossible with God. But just like an evil spirit needs a body to operate in, the Holy Spirit needs us to operate in those miracles. We don't do the healing, but right in the tip of our fingers is the fire of God. The fire of God is able to heal, deliver, and set free. I found out nothing is impossible with God. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. You know, one guy... His wife called me and said to me, I must lead him to the Lord because he was dying of cancer. This man was weighing over 250 pounds, over six foot five. But when I saw him, he was just skin and bone. 120 pounds laying in the bed dying of cancer. And every Saturday, she asked me to come minister to him. So I rode for half an hour every Saturday to minister to this man. And as soon as I got to the point where I wanted him to receive Christ, he said, I've got my church. And I kept on going for one year. And that morning I got up, I said, God, I'm not going to leave this man's house until he receives Christ because he's going to die. And so I went determined on that Saturday. I closed the door to his bedroom and I said to him, you know what the Lord said to me? Your church never died on Calvary. Jesus died on Calvary. And you need to accept him today or else you're going to go to a lost eternity. I said, do you want to receive Jesus? I mean, after a year, he said, yes. I asked him about 10 times. I couldn't believe it. And so when I led him to the Lord, I went to his wife in the living room. And she said, Pastor Newbury, we have to baptize my husband immediately because he's going to die. I carried that little man, I mean, 120 pounds. We baptized him in his bath, put him in the bed ready for burial. The wife said on the Monday, he got up. That man is still living. He's 92. (laughs) Our God is able. But he needs us to be obedient or vessels. We must let. Only one anointed person here. (laughs) Jessica, we must let. You better come help me with this message because. (laughs) Let. Rivers of living water. God has need of every one of us believers to realize what power we have. We have power to raise the dead. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, Reinhard Bonnke went to uh, Bible school in, in London. And when he was in Africa, there was a man by the name of Ngidi. This man has raised people from the dead. When he prayed for the sick, people were slain, healed. People got out of wheelchairs. But he had no education. He was illiterate. Somebody had to read the Bible to him, and he would go and preach a simple message. And Reinhard, when he saw this man preaching, he said, Lord, I want what that man has got. And the Lord said, you go sit at his feet, let him teach you. And so Reinhardt realized 
that all those biblical studies is nothing. You need the Holy Spirit. You can have the Word, but the Word without the Spirit. And then you can have the Spirit without the Word. You've got to have both. You have to have the Word and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. And the Holy Spirit introduces you to Jesus. He's the one that strives with man. And once people meet Jesus, they get stuck right there. But you know what Jesus said? I must go and the comforter will come. So you need to know who's walking this earth now is the Holy Spirit. Before I came here this morning, I had to spend time speaking to him. To ask him what message I must give. It's the Holy Spirit that leads and guides us. He's our comforter, our guide, and our teacher. You know, when the disciples said to Jesus, teach us to pray, you know why? Because they found out he had answers to prayer. We need to ask the Holy Spirit to teach us to pray. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah. He walks with you and he talks with you. The Holy Spirit's here this morning. And he already showed me what he's going to do. He knows everything. Praise God. Hallelujah. You need to have fellowship with the Holy Spirit. You know what fellowship is? Two fellows in one ship. <laughs> Praise God. When I'm in my car, I speak to him. Hallelujah. Amen. We must let rivers of living water. So the Lord said to me, no matter how great your anointing is now, it can be even greater and greater. God's divine plan is that the anointing is supposed to be forever increasing. Yeah. Amen. Don't yeah. it get stagnant? That's why I said, Reinhard Bonke, they, 13 people got out of wheelchairs in one day, in one meeting, but now, before he died, he was raising the dead. So the anointing increases. Yeah. All we got to do is be obedient vessels to the Holy Spirit. Yeah. Praise God. So while I was preparing this message, in Australia, the Lord said to me, I, I said to, to the Lord, you know how we can pray and we ask God for things we don't understand, we're asking him. I said, I want more power. Lord, I want more power. And he said, I cannot give you more power. You know the formula for electricity, for power is electricity minus the resistance. He said, there's too much resistance in you. So I said, what is the resistance? He said, this is a resistance in believers. Number one, sin. Amen. Hallelujah. Adultery, fornication, the lust of the flesh, and all these things will hamper the anointing. And the anointing breaks every yoke. So in Romans 7 verse 22, for I delight in the law of God, according to the inward man. Our inward man delights in the law of God. When God comes to indwell the believer, he not only gives him power, but he gives him power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. Notice the trinity of the devil. It's the world first, then the flesh, and then the devil. One day a pastor was late for the meeting, and he came running up the stairs. When he got to the top of the stairs, there the devil was crying. So the pastor said, devil, why are you crying? He said, because all the people in your church there, they blame me for everything. <laughs> the trinity of the devil is the world. I left this world a long time ago. Some people want one foot in the world and one foot in the kingdom of God. No, God wants all or nothing at all. He doesn't want you lukewarm. He wants you on fire for God. This world has got nothing to offer me. I've tried everything in this world that never gave me happiness. Praise God. But when I made Jesus, he put a smile on my face. And once I got a smile on my face, I'm well dressed. Praise God. Hallelujah. You can smile. Your face won't crack up unless it's been seized up for too long. Praise God. The joy of the Lord is your strength. Hallelujah. Some people look as if they bathe in lemon juice. And some people in the church, 
They stand, they dead, they just too lazy to fall over. God wants people that's on fire for God. That will run and do the job of the Lord. Hallelujah. Praise God. Amen. I don't know why I threw that in there. It must be the Holy Spirit. Praise God. Hallelujah. He also gives us power to overcome the world, the flesh, and the devil. He wants to break the outer man so that the inner man can become alive. You so know when your inner man is alive, both believers and unbelievers would want to hang around you. My neighbors all like me in the road. And they're getting saved one by one. So far, seven of the people in that road have been saved. You see, I pray for a soul every morning. If I don't get a soul in my neighborhood, I'm busy somewhere else. They don't understand that I help them and I don't charge them a cent. When I'm finished helping them out, they said, why do you do it for nothing? I said, just pray this prayer with me. You'll be amazed how many people get saved, delivered, and set free. You see, when the Spirit comes to indwell a man, hallelujah, we need to be broken. The Bible says, unless the alabaster box be broken, the perfume within will not be made manifest. Amen. The inner man is more precious than the outer man. Somebody, we adorn the outer man and we think it's more precious than the inner man. No, the inner man is more precious than the outer man. I was on my way to London and this man got on in New York. He was the most moody person I ever came across. I tried to witness to him. He wouldn't speak. And so I said, Lord, what's happening with this man? The Lord said, just leave him. So when we came towards London, you know, we fly at night, so in the morning they bring you breakfast. Just as I was going to have breakfast, you know, the Lord put a chorus in my mind. And now when you start singing the chorus of the Lord, the joy of the Lord comes upon you. And I was singing, 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 and all of a sudden this man turned towards me. Oh. All of a sudden the man turned towards me. He said, why are you so happy? He put his foot right in there. So I said to him, you know, before I was very sad. I used to worry every day. And I, if I had nothing to worry about, I worried about the fact that I had nothing to worry about. So he said, that's exactly how I feel. So what happened? I said, Jesus came into my life. And he gave me this joy. By the time we landed in London, you were saved. <laughs> You see, people will not read the Bible, but they will read you. When you can lose your job and you do a break dance, they will wonder why you're so happy. Praise God. Hallelujah. We are not in this, we are in this world, but we are completely different. When they laugh, we cry. And when we laugh, they cry. The joy of the Lord is our strength. And you know that joy is a weapon. Jesus said joy before him before he went to the cross. That's why the Bible says rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. That word rejoice comes from the word that says to turn around your circumstances. When you can rejoice when you go through adverse conditions. Paul and Silas had no reason to praise God at midnight. Midnight, you cannot see your hand in front of you. But when they praise and worship God at midnight, you should have seen that jailhouse rock. <laughs> praise God. You see, when God looks down at you and he says, that son or daughter of mine, they're going through such a trial. But they being obedient to my word, which says rejoice in the Lord always, give them what they need. Amen. Hallelujah. Remember when uh, jo Jehoshaphat had a problem. And he went and turned to God and prayed. And the Lord told him to choose 20 singers to go, go up against. He was outnumbered 150,000 to one from Moab, Mount Seir, and Ammon. And all they had to sing, praise the Lord for his mercies, endure it forever. They went ahead of the army. You know, David made the people from a tribe of Judah the leaders in the raiding band. 
People from the tribe of Judah are the worship leaders that take us into the Holy of Holies. Praise God. So when they sang that, their voices started echoing the mountains. Those 20 singers became 40. 40 became 80. Then these people said, this is a mighty army coming up against us. And they, they singing. They started fighting among themselves. You know what the Bible says? By the time the army got there, that were completely outnumbered, 150,000 to one. They had so much, it took them three days to collect the spoils. <laughs> Amen. They find diamonds, jewelry, and if they had a Rolex at that time, you could pick one up there too. <laughs> Praise God. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. You see, we need to know that unless the alabaster box be broken, the perfume within will not be made manifest. So we do need to say, Lord, break us. We need to be broken. God wants the flesh to die. Now I'm amazed that people minister that at the funeral, and every time they minister that, God tells me that's not what I mean. You know, they say the death of a saint is a sweet-smelling savor unto the Lord. That's not what God means. He means when you die to self, and your, your, your uh, carnal man burns up, and the inner man becomes alive, that's what's a sweet selling savor unto the Lord. Hallelujah. So we must die. God wants you dead. So that the Holy Spirit can move you and work with you. Hallelujah. Self must die so that the spirit man can become alive. Hallelujah. Amen. John 12 verse 24. Unless a kernel of wheat fall into the ground, it remains a single seed. But if it does, it produces many seeds. We must let rivers of living water. We must let. Hallelujah. God requires holiness. And the Holy Spirit can only work through holy vessels. Self must die so that your spirit man can become alive. So I said, Lord, show me an example of who died to self. In the way the Lord took me to the book of Samuel. That's why I tell you, you need to ask the Holy Spirit. Samuel was a very good child. His mother, Hannah, was barren for many years. And she kept on praying. Lord, give me a son and I will give him back to you. You see, when your need coincides with God's need, you're standing on a platform ready for a miracle. Yeah. Amen. Amen. You know, when I used to come in the middle of the night, I used to hot up motorcycles because I was a, an engineering student. And so all these gang members brought their motorcycles to me. My motorcycle was never fast enough. When I put that helmet on, these demons used to tell me, this is only a machine. Take it to the limit. I had an accident. I spent a year in hospital. They, they announced me dead on arrival. My mother said, he can, cannot be dead. He's got to preach the gospel. Praise God. And God raised me from the dead. Hallelujah. But my, my skull was cracked. My femur was broken. That time they never had this stuff. They put it in traction. But after I got out of hospital, I went back to what I was doing. Praise God. Hallelujah. But here I am preaching the gospel. When we used to sit at the supper table and my mother used to say to my brother, no matter what he does, one day he's going to preach the gospel. My brother used to say, since when can the devil become a preacher? <laughs> but here I am. But when I came in in the middle of the night and I walked past that room, I could hear her pray. Praise God. She was interceding. She left this earth before I got saved, but I believe she's looking down from heaven. And she's speaking to the Lord and just how proud she is that her prayers have been answered. Amen. Amen. So Hannah prayed and asked God for a son. And God, when he heard Hannah pray and said that you will give the son back to, to her. Amen. To him. He said, it is done. That's what I said. When your need coincides with God's need, you're going to have a miracle. Don't give up on praying for your sons. Hallelujah. God will make a way where there seems to be no way. So God said, it is done. 
So in 1 Samuel 2 verse 12, we read that the sons of Eli, they were corrupt. They did not know the Lord. But Samuel ministered before the Lord. I like the book of Samuel. I studied it now. Samuel ministered to the Lord. Hallelujah. They were well equipped, but they operated in the flesh. But Samuel ministered to God. While these young men were trying to satisfy the flesh, let me tell you something. You can never satisfy the flesh. <laughs> you can drink and drink even more. It will never be satisfied. You can lust and have even more lust. It will never be satisfied. But when God comes into your life, He's the satisfaction that you need. Yes. Hallelujah. <laughs> Praise God. Eli's sons were well equipped, but they operated in the flesh. Samuel, however, dared to be different. We need to dare to be different. Yes. Young man, young woman, this world has got nothing for you. All the devil wants to do is to kill you, to rob you, and destroy you. But he came that we may have life and life in abundance. The flesh will never be satisfied. And you need to dare to be different. The flesh profited nothing. When you are different, the anointing will keep on increasing. And when you see an increase in crowds, don't think that you have landed. I mean, I was in crowds of million people, two million people in Africa. But you know what the Lord said to me? You must minister to one like you minister to thousands. Jesus went out of his way for one soul. A demoniac that nobody wanted to have anything to do with was beating himself in a cave. And Jesus walked out of the town to get this man delivered and set free. Praise God. Crowds don't impress me. We need to be one-on-one -on -one and we also minister to others. Praise God. Hallelujah. When you start thinking that you are prospering, then the anointing will leave you. John the Baptist said that I must decrease that he increase. Hallelujah. Praise God. So don't think that you're doing it. God knows how to prosper you. Proverbs 28 verse 20 says, A faithful man shall abound with blessings, but he that maketh haste to be rich shall not be innocent. You know, my wife and myself, we lived by faith now for 38 years. And in this time of the pandemic, we could not travel. We were supposed to go to Barcelona, Spain, because when I went to preach in Naples, Florida, there was a lady that was born blind, 60 years of age, Spanish church. And we were worshiping God when they gave me the mic. And as I got into the pulpit, the Lord said to me, just continue praising. You know, sometimes we must just listen to what the Holy Spirit says. I said, the Lord said we must continue praising and worshiping. Nobody laid hands on that woman. All of a sudden, she started screaming and shouting. So her daughter came running up and said her mother was blind. She, uh, God opened up her eyes, born blind. She wanted to see a tree and a car outside. They took her out. Praise God, she came back in. And then there was a, a niece of hers that's from Barcelona, Spain. And they invited us to go to preach in, in, in Spain. You know, that pastor died of the virus. Linda and myself were packed to go to, that, to, to Spain. And we never went. Because the day before we had to leave, this happened. Where they canceled all the flights. So for three years, we haven't ministered, really. You know, very few meetings. But I kept on praying. And you know what started happening? I started getting checks in the mail. And then one uh, a guy called me, he's a medical doctor, and he gave me a Mercedes Benz. So I, I said, wow, look what God is doing. Then he called me again a week later. He gave me a Volvo station wagon. So I said, I got no place to, to uh, keep these cars. Maybe God wants me to sell this car. So I polished the car. I was admiring it. And the Lord said to me, don't you dare sell this car. You must sell this car. You must give it away. When I was just finished, he said, you're cleaning this car for somebody else. You know what's happening now? 
Somebody's been busy renovating your new house. They don't even know it. Somebody's detailing your new car. They don't even know that either. Praise God. So when I was finished admiring the car, this pastor calls me from Newport News and he said to me, Pastor Newbury, do you know where I can get a car? I said, as a matter of fact, I got one right here. But what I'm going to do, I'm going to charge you half price. Instead of four, I'll give it to you for two. And when I went inside, I said, Linda, this pastor called, you want the car? She said, Newbury, the Lord said you must give him that car. You mustn't charge him a set. So anyway, he called me back and he said he could pay so much per month, you know. So I knew, I said, okay, we're on our way. We went there, he looked at the car, he said, no, I like this car. And then he said, so what do we owe you? I said, not a cent. You know, since I gave that car away, I got five cars. <laughs> a man called me, he gave me a BMW 740iL. Another guy came, he gave me a... a Toyota Sienna. I gave that to another pastor. The cars are just coming. I'm just giving them away. And then he gave me a Mazda Miata. <laughs> and then I got a Jaguar. I don't know, God is... I said, Lord, you've got to stop it with the cars. I don't want to start a dealership now. <laughs> you see, when God starts blessing you, and you know, he can only bless you when your hands are open. When you give, God will give back to you. Pressed down, shaken together and running over, will men give into your bosom. When I came to America, I gave a, uh, before I left South Africa, I gave a Mercedes to a pastor. The first meeting I had, somebody threw the keys and the title of a Cadillac into the offering. So I know that God knows how to give to you. All you've got to do is be obedient to him. It wasn't easy for me to give that fast, that, that car away. That was my God. I used to polish it every weekend. Amen. But he will ask you to give the best, best just like Abraham. God asked him for his son. And then God gave us his best, his son. Hallelujah. So here the Bible says, but he that maketh hate to be rich shall not be innocent. The Bible says in 1 Samuel 2 verse 21 that Samuel grew before the Lord. It doesn't say that Samuel was getting older. It said he grew before the Lord. Praise God. You need to grow before God. You need to spend time with God. Hallelujah. So Psalms 92 verse 12 to 14. The righteous will flourish like a palm tree. Let me tell you something about a palm tree. Storms will come. If you look in Florida, the winds will come at hurricane speed. But the palm tree will never be uprooted. No matter what happens to us, we need to stand. The winds will blow, but we deep rooted. In the things of God. So when the devil starts messing. Take out the sword of the spirit. Like our sister did when she was sick. Hallelujah. Sometimes when I'm wearing a black suit. I look like Zorro. By his stripes I'm healed. <laughs> Praise God. When he says you're bankrupt. I say no devil. You will supply all my needs. According to riches in glory in Christ Jesus. You must know the word of God. Hallelujah. Jesus is the word and he hasn't lost a battle yet. They will grow like a cedar in Lebanon. The cedar trees go right next to the river. Deep rooted in the water. We must be deep rooted in the word of God. That's what the water is. Walls of water where the Israelites went through. Amen. With Moses. That was the word that kept the, the water divided. And in, I mean the word that the, was the miracle. Amen. But faith kept it divided because the rest, Pharaoh and his people had no faith. So the Israelites went through because they had faith, believing God 
far more than the belief circumstances. Praise God. Planted in the house of the Lord, they will flourish in our God. They will still bear fruit in old age and they will remain fresh and green. I'm not getting older, I'm getting younger. I got a step in me and no devil and no demon can stop me from being a person that rejoices in the Lord. Hallelujah. Amen. Praise God. And so the Bible says, first Samuel ministered to the Lord. Now it says, and Samuel grew before the Lord. Now it says, and Samuel grew on. And the Lord was with him. Amen. And he was in favor with both God and man. When you in favor with God, unsaved people will even want to hang around you. Because there's something about us. We are peculiar people. Chosen generation and royal priesthood. Hallelujah. Now look what it says next. And Samuel grew and the Lord was with him in 1 Samuel 3 verse 19. And let none of his words fall to the ground. Let me tell you something. Number one, Samuel ministered to the Lord. Then he started to grow. He continued to minister to the Lord, and then none of his words fell to the ground. There's so many false prophets that spend no time with God. I was preaching in Washington, D.C., and spoke about prayer. And this man walked up to me from New York. He said, I'm a prophet of hope and inspiration. I never saw a prophet like that, but he was sweating so much that day, I thought, you were a prophet of hope and perspiration. He said, and I don't agree with you, because I don't pray. I don't need to pray. I said, sir, then you cannot be a prophet. A prophet spends time in the presence of God, and when he speaks, everything came to pass. You hear how these people prophesied about the election? They all prophesy. They never spend time with God. They're so busy in their ministries. You see, the devil will get you so busy in what you're doing that you spend no time in headquarters. We have to spend time in the presence of God. Praise God. And then when you speak, whatever you speak will come to pass. These are false prophets when they speak something and it doesn't come to pass. They did the same thing when it turned to the year 2000. Everything was going to crash except their pocketbooks. They were asking people to give them money, draw the money out of the bank. No, that's not what God wants. These are false prophets. They're all over the world, not only here in America. The secret is, and God told me this a long time ago, there's a big difference when somebody's in the will of God and somebody's in the center of the will of God. He said, people that are in the will of God, they hear many voices. They hear his voice, they hear the voice of the enemy. They do many things. They do their own thing. They do what I tell them to do. He said, but when you're in the center of my will, there's only one voice that you hear, and that is mine. That's what Samuel did. Samuel ministered to God, and eventually when you keep on ministering to God, he's going to minister to you. And when God speaks, whatever he says comes to pass. Praise God. So none of Samuel's words fell to the ground. And everybody in that area knew that Samuel was a prophet of God. And all of Israel, from Ben to Bathsheba, knew that Samuel had been established as a prophet of God. You see, you don't have to, have to advertise your gifts that God gives you. Promotion cometh from the Lord. Samuel never told people he was a prophet. These people that tell you who they are and what their office are, I mean, I don't want any office. You know, in the Bible, everybody was called on their first names. Amen. Hallelujah. We are servants of the Most High God. Hallelujah. We don't glory in what the office that God gives us. Samuel never advertised himself, never went around telling everybody he was a prophet. You don't need to do that. The anointing will show. And God, when he establishes you, he can establish you anywhere. Hallelujah. You know, Reinhard Bonnke was stranded in Africa. So the Sutu people took him into Lesotho. 
because the people that invited him never picked him up at the airport. He went to Lesotho and he started playing a piano accordion at the bus stop. And God established him there where a school teacher at that time earned $20 a month. No ministry could survive there. But from there, God took him to having a million people coming to his meetings. God can establish you anywhere. Don't blame your circumstances or where you are living. When God establishes you, you are established. We must let. Hallelujah. Promotion cometh from the Lord. And if God is with you, the anointing will show. And God will not share his glory with anybody. When God establishes you, you are established. When you are hooked onto God, and God is hooked onto you, people will know that you are anointed and established by God. And when the anointing starts increasing, praise God, don't brag about it. Be humble. When you see God raising the dead, people being healed of cancer, it makes you feel this small because we serve such a big God. We know that this is impossible for you to do. You cannot even heal a flea. Praise God. Hallelujah. But God is able. And he's able to use you if you are let. Hallelujah. And so the Lord said to me, God uses men to anoint you. Atin Giddy laid hands on Bonky. He laid hands on me. He laid hands on Michael Collison. As soon as he laid hands on us, we started having miracles happening, people being healed. Praise God. Hallelujah. So today, the Holy Spirit is going to lay hands on you. You must just be available. In 1 Samuel chapter 16, the Lord spoke to Samuel and said to Samuel, Saul has found this favor with me. I want you to go to the home of Jesse and anoint one of his sons as king. So Samuel complained. He said, if Saul finds out, he's going to kill me. Besides that, when I get to Bethlehem, Judah, what am I going to tell the elders? Because the elders in the city, when a prophet came to town, they trembled. They thought, what's he going to say? What judgment is he going to bring upon the, the people there? And so the Lord said, you take a heifer with you and you take your oil, your horn of oil, olive oil, and you anoint one of Jesse's sons as king. And so when Samuel got to Bethlehem, Judah, the elders were trembling. He said, what are you doing here? He said, don't worry, I'm coming to have a sacrifice with the home of Jesse. And they let him go. When he got to Jesse's home, he saw Eliab, rugged, handsome, over six foot tall. He said, surely this is the one God wants me to anoint. He took his oil of oil and he was just about to anoint Eliab. When the Lord said, that's not the one. I do not look at the outward appearance of man. I look at man's heart. If your heart is right this morning, God is going to anoint you with this anointing. A very special anointing. We're going to let rivers of loving water, praise God, be available vessels to be used of God. And so seven of his sons passed before Samuel. God rejected every one of them. Now, if you are a prophet and God tells you to go and anoint some sons and you see seven of them, Samuel must have thought he made a mistake. He said, is there any more? They said, there's one more, but he's tending to the sheep. God was going to show us that he can make a shepherd a king. Right. Hallelujah. Yeah. Don't worry at where you at, are at today. God can change your life. Yeah. Hallelujah. He saves from the guttermost to the uppermost. Yeah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Amen. You know, in South Africa, there was a man that uh, the Holy Spirit knocked down in one of these big revivals. He had tattoos all over his face. He had a crucifixion on his chest. And Michael Collison said to me, Pastor Newbury, cast the demons out of this man. You know, it took me five hours. <laughs> you know, at that time we were new in this, this thing. 
Now we just go into worship and get people get delivered. But I was saying, come out in the name of Jesus, come out. But five hours to get this guy delivered. And when he was delivered, he said to me, Pastor Newby, I want to tell you something. I said, what's that? He said, I'm one of the men that's been killing people in this area. He said, every Friday, something used to come out up in me. And if I never stabbed a human being, I would have stabbed a horse or a dog. Hey, so I said, wow. So you mean all these people has been killed on a Friday? You're responsible. He said, I don't know how many people I killed. But I led him to the Lord. So what happened is, he calls me about three months later. And he said, Pastor Newbury, I want to be your bodyguard. I said, no, I don't need a bodyguard. I mean, a guy with all his tattoos and I'm in the ministry, you know. So what we have in South Africa, because people commute so far, because they chucked everybody out of the city. When, with this apartheid, you know, we had 25 of the houses repossessed. People have to commute by train. I said, you must become a train evangelist. You get on the train and you preach on the train. So he did that. Then one day he called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. He was in prison. And so uh, I had to drive about five hours to get to where this guy was. What happened is he got on the train and it was a, they have this place where you can sleep like an Amtrak. You know, they have a bed up. And he was, the woman was sitting at the window. He got in, into that same cabin and he slid over to the woman. When he went this way, the woman went that way. And then he was, now, a young believer, you wanted to lead her to the Lord. And so he said, how's he going to start talking to this woman? And he said, lady, if you should leave this earth right now, where will you spend eternity? The woman pulled the emergency. They stopped the train. They took him and put him in jail. <laughs> so he called me. I had to go there and tell him, no, this guy is evangelist. You know, and we had <laughs> all his records. <laughs> Praise God. But he's on fire for God. You know, this guy started getting gangsters saved. Then they found out he was the guy that was killing all the people. And that time they, they, they hung people in South Africa. He was about to be hung when he dropped down dead heart attack. God just took him home. But the amount of people he got saved. So it doesn't matter who you are. When you receive this anointing, go and get this job done. Praise God. Hallelujah. So Samuel anointed David. Praise God. Hallelujah. And ever since Samuel anointed David, David killed a lion. He killed a bear. And then he destroyed the Goliath. It's the anointing that breaks every yoke. Now this morning, the Lord wants to anoint you. He wants you to receive this anointing. So that rivers of living water can flow through you. You see, on the day of judgment, you will have no excuse. You will remind you of this message I told you, that God has need of you to lay hands on the sick, to lead people to the Lord. God could have raised up the stones, but he chose you and he chose me. We are his ambassadors. Wherever we go, the Holy Spirit goes. Amen. Amen. So God is calling you this morning. If you want to receive this anointing and let the rivers flow, just raise your hands. Hands are going up all over the show. Hallelujah. 